Okay, students. Um, hints and tips for F582, the national national economy. Um, just a reminder that the main exam room is in LG10 on Monday. Um, the exam, the examiners will start letting you into the room about quarter past nine, um, ready for the exam start. Um, bring a calculator because there may be Oh, there's likely to be a calculation question. Um, don't freak out if there's a question that comes up that you haven't seen before. That's bound to happen. And the case study will be things you've never seen before. Um, just try and spot the words in the question. So underline the words that you do know um, and try and reason out what the question is. You've studied everything that's on the paper. It's just figuring out what they're asking you. Um, take your time reading the questions so the answers aren't going to come instantly. You may, may just need a little bit of time to think things through before the information starts coming. And that's why planning is important, just to get your thoughts down before you start writing the question. Um, and when you're reading the case study, underline key important bits of information. So you're underlining the question in terms of the keywords, discuss, maybe inflation, maybe costs. Maybe it might say two costs, um, and then it'll keep you on target. And the same for the case study. Um, check the question again once you've kind of thought it through, especially when you're planning. So once you've done your plan, just check that your plan um, for the essay question answers the question. Um, remember that comment questions, and there's likely to be at least two on the paper. Um, and I'll go through the types of comment questions you might have in a second and um, they are two-sided so you need to look for one side or another side linked to the question and um, your discussion question is two-sided as well and it needs a clear conclusion and judgment and remember in your conclusion to try and use it depends upon something because and then if to justify it um, and there may be some trend analysis questions but one of those trend analysis questions might be a common question so be careful that you might be analyzing the data um, but also looking at um, what it shows. So I'll give some examples of those in a little bit as well. Um, so here is an example of a trend analysis question. Um, the first part of the question is saying, using the information, identify which year the price level was the lowest. Now, this is really key that there will, it's a, a one that examiners like to assess you on, the difference between price level and inflation rate, or the difference between real GDP and growth rate. Now the rates are the percentage changes in the levels. So the inflation rate is the percentage change in the price level. The growth rate is the percentage change in the real GDP. Now on the table here, you've got the inflation rate on this side, so the percentage change, and the inflation rate is increasing by 6.5%, so the price level has gone up 6.5% in 2002, it's gone up another 7% roughly in 2003, 6% in 2004, 2005. 7.5% and 8.5% in 2006. So every year is an increase on the price level. So the year that the price level was the lowest is 2002 because every year the price level increases by a positive percent. Um, the trick that they, most students fell for was that they said 2004 was the lowest. So just be careful with those type of questions. If it mentions price level or inflation, growth or real GDP, just be careful that you're not mixing up the rates with the levels. Um, most data questions though, will be asking you to summarize a relationship or a trend. So this one's four marks. So you're looking for kind of four key points. You have overall trends. So inflation is increasing and unemployment is decreasing in their rates. Um, that's two marks. Then you're looking for other key things. You could say that unemployment is more stable and inflation is more volatile. Um, you could say that they are the same amount in roughly partway through 2005 
um, you could say that unemployment starts at a higher rate than inflation, but by the end, inflation is a higher rate than unemployment. So you're looking for when you're looking at trend questions that are just summarizing or comparing, think of bullet points. Another trend question, and this is one of the types of comment question, is to comment on what the data shows. Um, sometimes it's relationships. And here there's a relationship between real GDP and unemployment. And the relationship, which is likely, is that as real GDP increases, unemployment decreases and vice versa. So here we've got unemployment, oh, the economic growth increasing and we've got the level of unemployment falling um, and even though it slows in 2001 there is still a further fall so overall we have um, a trend um, and the data does show that trend overall um, but as it's two-sided you have to look for some evaluation of that data and um, the easiest ones to do our size and time. Now, in terms of size, um, it's the number of countries involved. Now, you've only got one country there, which is the United Kingdom. So the UK might support that relationship, but other countries um, might not. In terms of time, it's the amount of time you've got. So you've got 96 to 2000, because this little one here and this one here means an estimate or a future estimate. And that's another way to evaluate, to say that the prediction might not be accurate. But you've got one, two, three, four, five years of data on the UK. You don't have 10, 20, 30. So you can criticise this in terms of size and time. Um, or you can look for little bits of data within this um, that don't support that view. So especially when the economy slows a little bit in 1999, the unemployment still continues to fall. Another question that, that may come up, and this is why you might need a calculator, are questions around the case study. Um, this one here is an example of using aggregate demand. So the C plus I plus G plus X minus M. And you're literally just adding everything together, taking away 74, and you'll get Norway's aggregate demand. So it says using figure two, calculate, no, it's aggregate demand, show you're working out. Um, Another little calculation may be something like this one. Um, figure one shows the expected impact of real GDP on government spending. Government spending was 120 million, while tax revenues was 200 million. So 200 million minus 120 equals 80 million, um, which would be a budget surplus. Um, and that's, again, just a quick calculation question. Just additions and subtractions or divisions um, are likely to be the calculation questions in the case study. Um, the, the main comment questions tend to be analysis from a change or a macroeconomic variable on one side, and the EO3 is the likely way it will get to the other side. So comment on the extent to which rising inflation will cause a balance of payments deficit, comment on the extent to which rising economic growth will cause inflation, and so on. So explaining how the thing on the left is likely to lead to the thing on the right, this tends to be the other comment type questions that you'll get. So step by step, just explain, maybe even if you've got time, a little graph to explain how these things on the left cause these things on the right. And um, what you're then looking for for the EO4 is why economic growth might not cause inflation. So there you would have maybe if it's long term economic growth and um, falling unemployment not leading to investment and um, it may be that businesses um, or corporation tax is high and this discourages businesses from reinvesting their profits and um, falling unemployment leading to a budget surplus while the government might decide to increase its spending this may cause a budget deficit and so on so it's just finding situations where those relationships may not happen um, the discuss questions tend to come from two different um, types. One of them is just the costs and benefits of economic growth or a recession. 
um, and then solving the negatives of economic growth. Um, costs or benefits of falling unemployment or falling employment. And just be careful that you underline the word um, as they are opposite. So falling unemployment means people going into jobs. Falling employment means people being made redundant. Um, the cost and benefits of inflation may come in lots of different ways. So rising inflation, inflation in general, lowering inflation rate. And if it says lowering rate, it's still positive. So three to two, the only time it's negative is if they would mention deflation and the cost and benefits to an economy of a balance of payments surplus or a balance of payments deficit. Um, the key it depends on for all of them are causes. And again, graphs which combine two changes will help you to evaluate. Very, very rarely there are graphs around cause of economic growth. So that would be one side short term, the other side long term. Cause of unemployment. So choose two different types so you can draw two different graphs. Cyclical and structural would be the key for those. Or causes of inflation. And again, that would be cost push and demand pull for the two sides. And then talking about which are more significant or worse for the economy and why. The last type of discuss questions come from the effectiveness of the policies to achieve the macroeconomic objectives. So increasing economic growth, lowering unemployment, a balance of payments, uh, surplus from a deficit um, or price stability, reducing the inflation rate to in line with target. Um, one of the key differences between the three policies are that monetary and fiscal are demand side, which means when you're analysing both sides before you evaluate, just analyse aggregate demand rising and falling, and supply side, as it says in the name, or rises and falls in aggregate supply. So when you're analysing for the two sides, just use one shift and shift aggregate demand if it's fiscal and monetary, and aggregate supply if it's supply side. It may not be worded as obviously as that, it may break the policies down into their parts. So instead of saying the effectiveness of fiscal policy, it may say the effectiveness of a falling income tax to generate economic growth, or a falling corporation tax to generate economic growth, a falling VAT, or an increase in government spending to reduce unemployment, um, or a falling government spending to reduce inflation. Um, when it comes to monetary policy, it's highly likely it will just mention interest rates, but there's also supply of money quantitative easing, which is the same thing, and strengthening or weakening exchange rates as potential policies to achieve objectives. And again, supply side policies may be the main question, but it may break it down into education to increase economic growth or reduce unemployment, privatisation and deregulation to reduce inflation, um, and so on. The key structure for those questions is trying to use on your two sides an aggregate demand and aggregate supply graph. So if you were looking at successful fiscal policies and monetary policies for economic growth, you'd be drawing that one. But then your unsuccessful policy would be this one. And then you'd be explaining it in terms of it's less successful when the economy reaches full capacity. Um, if you were trying to um, reduce inflation, then it might be less effective in the graph number six. Um, if it's fiscal policy, sorry, supply side policy, then successful supply side policies would be around this green graph up here, and the unsuccessful ones would be during a recession or low capacity within the economy when you're just increasing the size of the negative output gap with no change to real GDP. And then lastly, when you are coming to evaluate, you do double shift graphs because these show stable long-term benefits for the economy.